Hello, welcome to Mainline MUFON. I'm Jennifer Stein, your host for the Mutual UFO Networks program here at Radnor Studio Channel 21. If you'd like to learn more about the free monthly guest lectures and film screenings that we do at the Public Tredifferent Library, please visit MainlineMUFON.com and look at our programs page to see our schedule. We also have a video page where you can go to see interviews that we do here at Radnor Studio and also watch presentations which have been previously filmed and posted online. Peter Robbins is our special guest today. He is a respected investigative writer specializing in the subject of UFOs for more than 40 years. He's a frequent guest on national radio programs like Coast to Coast, the BBC World Service, KGA, KGRA, the Art Bell Show, and 21st Century Radio. Peter has appeared as a guest consultant at, in numerous documentaries and television specials, like the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Unsolved Mysteries, Good Day New York, The O'Reilly Factor, and the Sci-Fi Channel, just to mention a few. Peter is a seasoned UFO researcher, and he's often called upon to be a guest lecturer, a master of ceremonies, a panel moderator, and a key conference consultant and organizer for many of the top UFO conferences around the world. Some of these have included the Open Minds International UFO Congress in Phoenix, Arizona, the X Conference in Washington, D.C., the Greater New England UFO Conference, and the New York City's Intruders Foundation, the Exeter New Hampshire UFO Festival and Conference, the McMinnville, Oregon UFO Festival, the Crash Retrieval UFO Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, and the Experience or Speak Conference in New England in Portland, Maine, and the UFO Mega Conference in Lachlan, Nevada, and the Mutual UFO Regional Conferences and National Symposiums, as well as the Roswell, New Mexico Annual UFO Conference. Peter, Peter was a key witness providing testimony for the 2013 citizens' hearings held in Washington, D.C. Internationally, Peter has spoken for UFO organizations in Japan, in Tokyo, the World UFO Forum in Brazil, the Exobiology International Meeting in Milan, Italy. He's also presented in Paris, Bordeaux, Nice, Toulouse in France, and in Rome, Italy, and Liverpool. England, and in Athens, Greece. Peter has also presented for academic institutions like the Cambridge Hospital in Boston, Cornell University in New York, the Juilliard School, and the School of Visual Arts in New York City, the Royal College of Science and Technology in London, England, and the Universities of Cardiff, Leeds, Hamlin, and Glasgow, and the Summerhill Schools in Suffolk, England. Peter was an editorial assistant for the United Nations Secretary General's requested report for the establishment of a United Nations UFO department and an editorial assistant for a related paper for the House of Lords debate on UFOs that happened in the United Kingdom. As a founding member of Bud Hopkins Intruders Foundation, Peter served on the advisory board and also was the executive assistant to Bud Hopkins. He was a key event coordinator for the Sci-Fi Channel's Alien Abduction Symposium, and he helped to organize and promote the release of Steven Spielberg's miniseries, Taken, and a writer, planner, and producer of a DVD box set called The Ultimate UFO and The Ultimate Crop Circle Production. Peter has written for Open Minds Magazine, Fate Magazine, UFO Magazine, in the U.S. and for Phenomenon Magazine, the UFO Data Magazine, and UFO Matrix, all in the United Kingdom. He's also written for RJ Journal of UFO Studies in Japan and numerous other publications and websites all around the world. He was the editor-in-chief of the website ufocity.com and was the associate producer of the multiple award-winning feature-length documentary film called Travis, The True Story of Travis Walton. Peter is very, very glad to be returning here to Mainline MUFON, and we're really happy to have him. Thank you, Peter, so much for coming down 
to Pennsylvania and sharing with us tonight your, your program. You're welcome. I'm exhausted after that introduction. <laughs> Can we go home now? <laughs> well, you're an extremely versatile person, Peter, and everyone knows that. Not only are you uh, really an expert in the UFO uh, perspective historically, but you've taken upon you yourself to do some in-depth research on some key people. And tonight you're going to be speaking about James Forrestal. What was it about James Forrestal that really attracted you to do this in-depth research? It's almost 30 years of research, yeah, right? Yeah, indeed. Uh, 30 years on and off. Um, I guess it was triggered by the fact that when I was first introduced to him, um, which came up uh, in an extraordinary um, uh, moment in ufological history with the release of the so-called Eisenhower briefing document uh, in 1987, very controversial. Um, his name was one of the 12 individuals who were uh, in this um, alleged UFO working group around President Truman. And I realized that while the name might be vaguely familiar to me, I really wasn't familiar with it. Um, I spoke to my mom shortly after this, who was a teenager at the time that he was Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Navy, and um, told her I decided to do <clears throat> an investigation into one of these alleged members, these 12 men around Truman, um, partly inspired by a, a brilliant research paper that our friend and colleague Stanton T. Friedman had given in 1987 at what would have been MUFON's 40th anniversary conference, not of MUFON, but of uh, Roswell and the Kenneth Arnold events of 1947. Uh, at that time, Stan uh, presented research uh, establishing that um, Donald K. Menzel, head of astronomy at Harvard, uh, indeed had lived a double life as a respected academic uh, astronomer and as a member of our national security establishment. And I thought, what a wonderful um, investigation it was. And the idea of, of doing something similar was something I wanted to aspire to. And I gave my mom a, a list, a short list of names of, that I was focused in on. And she said, do Forrestal. I said, OK, why? She said, uh, I remember him well. And you have no idea of the impact that he had on our winning the war and uh, how the nation mourned after he took his own life. Um, and frankly, uh, I thought he was also very handsome, a very sharp dresser, very charismatic, and I had a crush on him. I thought, my mom had a crush on the Secretary of Defense. I need to research this. And that's how I became involved. But then it became very serious and something I returned to uh, with different hiatuses for years to develop uh, the information that I have to the point that I'll be giving this presentation tonight. Right, right. Uh, we were speaking about him last night, and of course I was looking at the amazing photos that you have uh, to share with us tonight. And I was thinking about comparing Forrestal to the current like political arena we have and the political key figures yeah. we have. You know, I'm wondering if there's anyone you would say he would sort of compare to that um, you know, people in our generation may remember, because Forrestal was actually dead before I was born. Sure. You know, I was born in 55, yeah. and he passed away before that. If there was someone who you would say he would be a combination of these people, what would you say? Who, who would you bring to mind? Uh, I would say, um I'm damned if I can think of anybody, even right. in combination. Right, but uh, maybe a little bit like how we think of President Kennedy, maybe a little bit like Clinton. He had a lot of panache and a lot of poise and a lot of style. He was very charismatic. And he did have those things going for him. But he was um, very smart, too. He was. Um, Dartmouth, Princeton, uh, very familiar with the classics, studied ancient Greek, um, uh, an accomplished amateur sportsman. But above all else, something that um, the word is so overused in our current culture, especially in the Beltway area, he was a true old-fashioned patriot who loved his country uh, more in a way than he loved living a comfortable life. Um, and it cost him tremendously. 
He was dedicated to the safety and the security of the United States of America. He, um, again, gave up a very comfortable living. Uh, he was a tremendous self-made success on Wall Street and uh, in the world of business, um, had a phenomenal circle of famous friends. Um, he, he could have lived a very happy, comfortable life, and instead uh, he rose to the challenge of public service at one of the most demanding times in American history and literally gave his all. Um, again, the word patriot is so maligned, overused, debased in our current political culture. Um, I cannot think of anyone serving in public life today who I would compare to him in terms of self-sacrifice and um, not looking for an interior angle to either get rich or uh, mm -hmm. benefit personally from. Mm -hmm. I was very um, surprised when I was reading through your notes to find out that there was actually a close connection between the then, at the time, the Secretary of Navy, James Forrestal, and a young PT boat commander named, of course, uh, John F. Kennedy. Can you elaborate a little bit on this period of time and this relationship? Mm. Um, it's a brief period of time, and one of those uh, areas of investigative work that people like me live for, where you stumble upon um, a fact uh, that seems completely uh, out of place, and then you're able to corroborate it with a completely independent source uh, immediately after the cessation of hostilities with Germany in the spring of 1945. Uh, then Navy Secretary Forrestal, with a small delegation of individuals, traveled to Germany and then returned later that year. On both occasions, he had with him um, John F. Kennedy. Uh, we know this in part because we have several photographs of them together uh, on the ground in Germany. And my first thought was, what is a, you know, a, a PT boat commander uh, doing with the Secretary of Navy um, in Germany. There's very little that I could access about it in terms of the written word. Bottom line, though, was um, John Kennedy was not just some PT boat commander, uh, nor was he even um, a, uh, uh, a generic hero. And he was a, gen a general, a, a true hero uh, when his boat went down and he, he saved the life of at least one crewman. Um, he was, in fact, the privileged son of a former um, ambassador to the court of St. James to England. And I think there is enough uh, pointing toward his being uh, a naval intelligence officer as well as a PT boat commander um, to suggest that his, uh, the title that he had at the time as a working journalist who just happened to luck out and get uh, this plum assignment with the Secretary of Navy. Um, but there was that association in Forrestal's last years and in Kennedy's very beginning uh, as a public figure uh, on, the, on the world scene. So James Forrestal, uh, history tells us that James Forrestal actually committed suicide mm -hmm. at Bethesda Naval Hospital in May of 1949. Yeah. But you, um, in your presentation, uh, and your research can clearly state that you're convinced that, in fact, James Forrestal was murdered. So what evidence are you, will you be sharing with us mm. about that? Yeah. Um, well, number one, um, I'm convinced beyond um, any reasonable doubt. Obviously, I don't have um, uh, testimony from the people that killed him or photographs of them pushing him out the 16th floor window that he... Uh, exited this life from. Uh, it's a case that I've taken years to build based on an extraordinary amount of circumstantial evidence, which is rooted in the understanding that in 1949, um, for a alpha male at the, in the absolute inner circle of power, um, somebody who was looked up to by other alpha males as a player um, a, a person who uh, 
uh, as I used to say about John Kennedy, all the men wanted to have a drink with him and all the women wanted to sleep with him. Um, that he was um, a competitive level amateur boxer, that he was a professional level golfer and tennis player. Um, uh, again, well read in the classics, um, but nobody knew anybody in 1949 who saw a therapist, has, uh, was um, seeing a psychiatrist, um, and certainly nobody knew anybody to speak of involving an alpha male who had a nervous breakdown. That's for girls. And the fact that it was the head of the Department of Defense, the man charged with the defense of this nation. Um, what caused it? This is where, uh, I guess, for many people, the most controversial aspect of my argument really comes in, namely that um, a factor informed by a lifelong habit of personalizing his professional successes and failures, rather than leaving the failures at home at night, going home and reading the paper and hanging out with your family, uh, it tore at him. Also, he seemed to lack the ability to truly and deeply confide in anyone. He had, as if he had built a wall around himself. And the knowledge that the UFO phenomena, which you and I do not have the luxury of disbelief on, uh, it is real. Some of it represents truly anomalous uh, advanced technology under intelligent control from parts unknown coming and going with impunity for reasons we can only guess at, um, that he knew every nuance of this. And even though he headed the largest and most powerful defense establishment, let's say in history, um, not counting ancient, uh, pre-ancient history, um, that he could do nothing about it. Uh, it caused him to crack. And when he cracked and went into a full-scale breakdown, uh, the men closest to Truman, um, I, I think, agreed almost in an um, organized crime way. It's nothing personal, but he has to die. If he gets well, whatever that means, and then has a relapse, he could say anything. Uh, Forrestal understood this and, in fact, did try to take his life several times in the days following this very public breakdown, but was stopped each time and then went into treatment uh, and then began to respond to treatment. The case that I'm building, though, um, I'm not going to give the details here. I want to save those for this evening. Um, but it is a very carefully orchestrated presentation of facts, including um, investigations by some of the most respected investigative writers of the time and allegations by some of the people closest to him back then that he had most certainly been murdered and not had a sudden fit of depression hours before he was scheduled to be released from the hospital and complete his recovery at the, the estate of a family friend. There's a lot of things that are going on in this period of time, I would say between 1947 and 1952, when um, we separated the Army and created the Air Force, and we created the CIA, and we changed the way the public had access to data. We started the official Blue Book project. How do all these tie in, do you think, to what was going on with James Forrestal? Mm. In that sense, I think uh, for students of American history, 1947 is the most interesting year in the 20th century for me, uh, in part because of what's going on just below the surface. Um, as you noted, in 1947, um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA, um, the um, um, uh, the Air Force, uh, a number of things that were the spark that the core of this infant national security state, which now we are 110 uh, percent, were set in motion. And the person at the top of the pyramid orchestrating and overseeing all of this was arguably President Truman, but right next to him was James Vincent Forrestal. Um, there is no question in my mind that that piece of sand at the center of the pearl that 
you know how pearls work to keep from being irritated by that piece of sand building the calcification. That piece of sand was not our nuclear secrets program. It was what we were withholding or um, not telling the public about starting in 47 about what we knew or didn't know about these truly anomalous um, flying saucers, uh, aerial disks, you know, use your own acronym. And that Forrestal knew where all of the bodies were buried, so to say. Everything that happened, every sighting report came across his desk. And as somebody charged with the responsibility for the security of the nation, who at the same time uh, lived by a very strict code of um, putting the country first and his own needs security, peace of mind second, um, what we see is on the level of a Greek tragedy. Uh, I, I can actually think of more parallels in fiction than in real life. And one thing that I occasionally point out to people is if the great American novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald had based his most famous character, Jay Gadsby, um, on a real person, not that he did, uh, it easily could have been James Vincent Forrestal. Wow, such a such a tragedy. It's a shame that he's really not uh, better understood or well remembered in this country. Yep. Uh, there are a few uh, buildings named for him, a library, I think, somewhere. But uh, overall, correct, he's mostly lost to history. Exactly. And, and that's a great tragedy, is it not? It is. And um, if nothing else, what my aim in this particular tangent of self-assigned research has been is to um, do something about that, if not to correct it, to bring the story of his life and uh, murder to the attention of more and more Americans. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm doing this in a somewhat experimental way this evening and over the past year or so as not you know, a variation on a standard kind of conference lecture with, you know, clicking away at slides, but to do it in a manner um, that is highly dramatized and not quite theater, but certainly not a lecture, is to um, test the waters in terms of reaching out to a larger audience, whether or not this mutates ultimately into an actual drama or um, stage play uh, remains to be seen. But for now, I'm happy with the way it's developing, and um, I hope that uh, our audience uh, enjoys it this evening. So if people want to follow up with you, uh, in your long introduction, they know uh, your certainly list of incredible accomplishments and how people call on you uh, for you know, references and to comment on various things. But if the general public watching this want to follow up with you or learn how to contact you, what's the best way? Really simple. You can email me at uh, probbinsny at yahoo.com. Uh, you can visit my website, peterrobbinsny.com, or join me on Facebook. Um, and it's on Facebook primarily that I post um, everything that I'm working on, uh, talks that I'm giving, uh, engage in you know open dialogues with folks. Um, but any of those three ways is fine. Great. I'm so delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. And if you're joining our program late, my guest today was Peter Robbins. And you can uh, watch more of this uh, program at uh, MainlineMUFON.com on our video page. And uh, maybe we'll even be posting your lecture there as well on our video page. So thank you so much. I'm your host, Jennifer Stein. And I'm glad you joined us today here at Radnor Studio 21.